something I want to point out as I've gone over this subject is I've come to realize in more depth the seriousness of sin and how the Lord truly does hate it and how it cannot be ignored. These are things I see in more, with more clarity, having observed this sacrifice, this offering that's being made. And one of the disadvantages we have in our time particularly is men do not realize the seriousness of sin. They don't see how wicked it is and how much God really hates it. They don't understand why does he hate sin. They don't see the wrong in the offense. So there seems to be a tendency, a kind of spirit in our time to minimize transgression, to make it seem like it's not as bad as like, well, what, why would God do that? You know, or they, they, they say, surely God wouldn't, you know, they kind of start their arguments like this. And maybe they like, one way I could think of that they try to minimize is they say, well, sin's just an action. It's just something you do. And they like, they base theological positions on this, but that's a minimization of sin. I tend to show you that it's much deeper than just something you do, even though that's involved. Yes, you can be condemned. You can be charged with sin because for doing something, but it's more than that. It's more than just action or just doing something. In the 94th Psalm, it says that the Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. He's talking about thoughts. In Proverbs 24, 9, it says a thought of foolishness is sin. Is that, that's not talking like an unwanted thought, like mentioned in Romans, in Romans chapter 7, like an, an, an invasion, an intrusion into the mind that you just thrust out, you didn't want in there. It's a cultivated thought, something you thought on, something you stirred up yourself, you dwelled on it, foolish thought, something that had nothing, didn't, it didn't benefit you in any way. You're off track now, you're distracted. A foolish thought, a foolish thought is sin. But, you know, that's involving the mind. Sin, you know, affects what you do. That's established, but it affects what you think. But it goes deeper than that. Jeremiah 17, 9 speaks about how the heart is deceitful, wicked. Who can know it? That's said about the heart. This next one, I'm actually going to read it to you. It was spoken by our Savior in Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. He says, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. Verse 19, and for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. There's the thought. Thought of foolishness, it has its origin too. It, it goes deeper than just an accident of something like that. Then it adds more. What comes out of the heart? Murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These things are said to come from the heart. Now the thing I'm trying to establish here is sin, not so much like the committing of an act, but it's like there's a nature to it. It's something that affects the totality of your person. It affects what you do. It affects what you think. It affects what you desire. When sin has engulfed a person, everything he wants is wicked. Everything he thinks is wicked. And therefore, the action, which is the manifestation of what's within, is only something that displeases the Lord. Now, having established that, the scriptures are clear. This is a hindrance on our part. You have sin. There's just things you cannot do. Even if God requires it. Ephesians chapter 2 speaks on this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse, verse 12, speaks about this, speaks about a hindrance. It says, And at that time, that's before you were in Christ, at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So it mentions that without Christ, without God, no hope, strangers, aliens. Well, that's a great description, isn't it? Aliens. It's an outcast. Someone who does not belong where you're at. You hear like the term illegal alien. It's someone who doesn't belong here. You belong over there. Get out. Go back where you came from. You don't have your citizenship here. That's kind of a picture right here of what sin did. Sin's on you. God says, you can't come here. You can't come in this place. You go. You get away from me. Drive them out. That's what sin does. And what's the basis? Without Christ, without God... That's because of sin. That's why you're without Christ. That's why you're without God. That's why you're without hope. Because until that's changed, until that sin is taken away, it's dealt with, put out of the way, the hope can't be offered. And Christ cannot join himself to you, can't dwell in your heart by faith, and God cannot call you his child. Now also it says in Ephesians 5.8, it says, You were at one time darkness, but now you're light, plus the latter part of that verse, but it says you were one time darkness. Not in darkness, you were darkness. 
That's what the that's the word of God's evaluation. It says in First John one five, it says that in God there's He's God is light, in Him no darkness at all. So I mean, let's just do the math here. You're darkness, you are darkness, and God is light, and no darkness at all. Like what's what's the what's the inevitable conclusion? Well, Second Corinthians six fourteen, it says, "What communion hath light with darkness?" It's a contradiction. You can't mix. Some, in order for there to be true unity, one has to change. And God's not changing. You have to change. Now I'm going to show some accounts that like speak about God's reaction to sin. Some of them are they're not exactly pleasant accounts to go over, but it's proper to do that so that we could see in more depth how the Lord feels about sin, like his reaction to it. It's important that we see this. Now, in the very first sin committed, Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God. They ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When he said, don't eat that fruit, and they did it anyway. So what's the result of this? Genesis 3, 24, and so he drove out the man. He drove out the man and placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword, which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. That's the result of a sin, one sin. One act of disobedience, God drives the man out. You're no longer worthy to be in this place. See, that, that shows you. That's how God reacts to sin. He drives it out of his presence. He will not keep it there. It has, to, it has to depart. There has to be some kind of departure. Also, in Genesis chapter 6, this is the account of the flood. We read in verse 6 and 7, this is what the Lord said about man. <coughs> He said, and the Lord was sorry he even made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. That's a very discouraging word. He grieved in his heart. But what's the basis for this judgment? Verse 5 tells us, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every action? No, this isn't what it says. It says that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. That's the basis. And so what was the judgment? I'm going to destroy man because of this. That's the Lord's reaction to sin. It won't, it's not going to stay there. It's going to leave. And if destroying the world's what it takes, that's what God's going to do. And so just, just a few chapters later here in Genesis, just chapter 38, speaking of Ur and his brother Onan, it says of Ur, it says, but Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. That's all you really know about Ur, and then the fact he was born, who his father was, that's about it. But that was the basis. He was wicked in his sight. We don't exactly know what he did, but that, that's all you need to know. He was wicked. And that was the result. God, like, snuffed it out. This next account, it's, I admit, it may be a bit of a crude text, because there's a younger one here. I won't go into detail of the offense itself, but rather emphasis more on the, the, resu- the consequence of it. It says, but this is speaking of Onan, but Onan knew that, let's see. And Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and marry her and raise up an heir to your brother. But Onan knew the heir would not be his. And it came to pass that when he went to his brother's wife that he admitted on the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he killed him also. Now just look at the fence. They say, now Ur, you got, he was wicked in his sight. You know, that could cover a whole ground, a whole bunch of ground. Like he did, he did a whole bunch of stuff the way he lived. But this says he... The thing he did, the thing he did, one thing, Onan did. It says, displeased the Lord, and the Lord killed him. One offense was enough for God to be just in taking his life. That's a picture. I mean, I'm only showing this just to show. This is, it's important to see God's hatred to sin. He's not going to tolerate it. It's purely wicked in his sight. What about Herod? When he was in royal apparel in Acts chapter 12, he spoke to the people, and they said, it's a voice of a God. And it said, because he gave not God the glory, the angel of the Lord smote him. He was eaten with worms and he died. That's because he gave not God the glory. See, that's, that's a reaction to sin. That's what God did because of sin. Based on an offense. Let's go over just a few other things. It's, let's go to the law. In the law, you frequently read the term put to death. Here's some offenses that mention that. This is just... <coughs> Capital punishment based on a sin. They're striking a man to kill him. They are to be put to death. Ones who kidnap a man and sell him, they are to be put to death. Cursing father and mother, put to death. 
Even animals. This applied to animals. If an animal, like an ox, gored someone to death, stone that animal. Kill it. Sodomy and bestiality, put to death. Profaning the Sabbath day, put to death. Those who uh, give any of their descendants to Molech, that's an that's a offense that was put to death. Adulterers and adulteresses, blaspheming God. All these things were ca- were ex- made you worthy of death. And, ex- and capital punishment was executed because of just doing this. So, I mean... <laughs> Accounts like these should like cause us to think a lot more seriously about sin. It's not something we think casually about. I mean, there's sins. You see some of these sins committed in our day. You think like well, people, God used to kill people over this. Kill them. That alone should make you afraid to do it. The fact that the Lord slew a man because he did that offense, it shows that he truly does hate that thing. Now, what's the what, what's the one of the biggest problems? One of the Biggest things about sin that makes it so serious. Okay, we see the offense. It has its results. God truly hates it, but you're in bondage to it. That's a real problem. Jesus himself said, he who, is, who commits sin, he's the servant of sin. Yeah. You're entangled in it, tied up, bound, shackled in it. You can't get loose. It's serving like a taskmaster, like you know, uh, Israel with Egypt. They had taskmasters that made them labor, made them work. And so the sin kind of serves that purpose for you. It's a hard taskmaster. And you don't have the power to get out of it yourself. So you have this. You have this sin, this presence, this nature that is truly evil. And God can't accept you with that. Romans 6.20, it says that when you were the slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. Free from it. And not freedom is not good in that sense. So we see here, indeed, the need for sin to be dealt with. Seeing that it is so serious, seeing it is so wicked, something has to be done about this. Mankind can't survive, it can't go on with this in the way. So I'll read again this uh, text in Leviticus. You'll see some really particular things in this. Leviticus 6, 25 through 30. Speak to Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, the sin offering shall be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest who offers it for sin shall eat it. In a holy place it shall be eaten. In the court of the tabernacle beating. Everyone who touches its flesh shall be holy. And when its blood is sprinkled on any garment, you shall wash that on which it was sprinkled in a holy place. But the earthen vessel in which it is boiled shall be broken. If it is boiled in a bronze pot, it shall be scoured and rinsed in water. All the males among the priests may eat it. It is most holy. But no sin offering from which any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of mean. To make atonement in the holy place shall be eaten, it shall be burned in the fire. So see, you kind of have a picture here of sin being dealt with. Like there's things that have to be done in order for that to happen, though. One of the main things you see is, not only does sin have to be dealt with, but it has to be done in a certain way. It can't be just done like any way. Like God can't just speak it out of existence. He doesn't have just like this long list of ways to take away sin. It has to be done this way, or it's not going to happen. One of the main things I think of concerning like the need for sin to be taken away is like the new covenant. The things that the Lord promised, I'll give you a new heart, a new spirit. Promises to bless his people, accept them, I'll be their God, they shall be my people. That can't happen until sin's dealt with. That's right. In Hebrews 10, 9, it says he takes the, take away the first and he may establish the second. That's the point. <laughs> but that's the thing. When sin's dealt with, that's when this new covenant comes into, comes into play. Now, at this point, I'm going to like, show some things about the sin offering, things about it, and uh, compare those things that, with things that Christ has done. So we might, see the, we might see Christ in these accounts. Now, in case you, you didn't notice, when reading this account in Leviticus chapter 6, this is really complicated. This is not simple by any means. But then again, like, what exactly does the Lord ask you to do that is simple or easy? Think like, with, man with a withered hand, stretch forth your hand. Is that easy? Man with a withered hand, do that? Or how about a man sick, he's laying, can't walk. Get up, stand on your feet. That's not something that, you know, like, I, like the unbeliever, they would scoff that. That's impossible. Well, I faith these things are possible. But the thing we're seeing here is there's a lot of preparation that went into this. There's a lot of work that went into this, a lot of labor. Took, it also took um, a lot of devotion. It couldn't be done sloppily. And it was particular. You have to do it this way or you mess up on one of these things I tell you to do. 
Because, I mean, you see that count, like you have to kill this particular animal and this particular page, you have to kill it a particular way, and then you got to take these certain body parts out, and, you know, things. it's very particular. You, you got to do everything just the way I say it, or it's not accepted. I want to show an example of this. Just a few chapters back, in Leviticus chapter 4, just starting at verse 1, so the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a person sins unintentionally against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which ought not to be done, and does any of them, if the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt on the people, and let him offer to the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish as a sin offering. And he shall bring the bull to the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, lay his hands on the bull's head, and kill the bull before the Lord. Then the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of meeting. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar, sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall pour the remaining blood of the bull at the base of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle meeting. And he shall take from it all the fat of the bull as a, sin, as a sin offering, the fat that covers the entrails, and all the fat which is on the entrails, the two kidneys and the fat that is on them by the flanks, and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys, he shall remove. As it was taken from the bull of the sacrifice of the peace offerings, the priest shall burn them on the altar of the burnt offering. Look, good grief. Look, you think that's, that's a simple procedure? <laughs> Listen to all the detail in that. You had to do things just the right way. Well, let's like read another account on this. Now, that's about like the offering itself, the preparation work, things that had to happen when offering the sacrifice. So let's, let's go to the offense, like what had to be done in order for you to have to give us an offering. This is just one chapter later. Vegas chapter 5, starting at verse 1, read through verse 6. If a person sins in hearing the utterance of an oath and is a witness, whether he hath seen or known of that ma the matter, if he does not tell it, he bears guilt. Or, if a person touches any unclean thing, whether it is the carcass of an unclean beast, or the carcass of an unclean livestock, or the carcass of an unclean creeping things, he is, and he's unaware of it, he shall also be unclean and guilty. Or, if he touches human uncleanness, with whatever uncleanness with which a man may be defiled and he's unaware of it, when he realizes it, then he shall be guilty. Or, if a person swears, speaking thoughtlessly with his lips, or to do evil or to do good, whatever it is that a man may pronounce by an oath, and he is unaware of it, when he realizes it, then he shall be guilty in all any of these matters. And it shall be given, when he is guilty in any of these matters, that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord for his sin, which he had committed. A female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats as a sin offering, so the priest shall make atonement for him constrained sin. So he even then, like, just what has to happen in order for the sin be, sin offering be given. That's complicated. He gives you a whole list of stuff. Don't do any of this. If any of this happens, it's a long list, isn't it? That's not simplistic at all. So we see the particular how particular the sacrifice is, but let's like look to this, the fulfillment of these things that have been foreshadowed, that being the salvation itself. And you can only imagine if the shadow is as complicated as this, then surely the fulfillment of the thing being the, of the type is surely complicated as well. Now concerning our Savior, we have this account in Philippians chapter 2, verses let's see, 6 through 8. Speaking of Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now, you notice the transition there. That's, not, there's, that's actually kind of a complicated thing. Uh, Jesus, the Word who was in the beginning, the Word who was with God, the Word who was God, that Jesus, the one who created all things, and in earth, the one by whom all things consist, that Jesus had to become a man in order for your sins to be taken away. That's part of the process, you could see. And that wasn't an easy process by any means. And I don't, that's, that's just like the offering itself. But what about the prep work? Like you see, in the, you see in the sin offering, there's like preparation that has to go into this. And so likewise, there was a prep work, you could say, for the salvation of man. God had to ready the world for the Savior to come into it. He couldn't just put him in at the Garden of Eden. He couldn't like put him in at the time of Moses, or the time of Joshua, or the time of the judges, or the time of David. Wasn't fit at the time. He had to first create the world. 
Because this is something that God purposed before the foundation of the world. That's what it says. Christ was the Lamb foreordained before the foundation of the world in 1 Peter 1, verse 20. And if you think about it, nothing simple, something that's just easy to put together, takes a lot of time to do. And look at all the time it took for salvation to come to pass. It took a lot, thousands of years. Yeah. That's complicated. He had to create the world. He had to show man's vulnerability. <laughs> Couldn't stand on his own. That had to be shown. Yeah. And then he had to show man can't stand on his own. Man cannot serve me without me city doing something. So he, you know, the law comes in. The tabernacle comes in. Gives him the advantage. Okay, if you want to be righteous, you want to be accepted, just do all this. Well, they couldn't do it. <laughs> couldn't do it. But that was, there was a purpose for that. That was preparation for the offering. Amen. They had to be ready to accept the offering. They had to see that. Amen. They had to see that we need a Savior. We need someone to take this away for us. We can't do it. And what we come up with isn't good enough. God has to do this. That had, that had to come. And so uh, up to that, then when you get to the actual fulfillment, Christ, he's the, he's the form of God. He's the word. He becomes a baby, and he has to grow up. He has to learn obedience, live by faith. He has to be tested in the desert by the devil. He has to be proven to be the one. This is the one, the sacrifice, the sin offering. This is the one we offer. That had to be shown, and he had to be rejected by men, suffer many things, and ultimately he had to be crucified. Even the type of the death, he had to be crucified, not stoned, not hanged, crucified. That was the will of God. So even like the, the type of the death, too. But this shows, like, just in the account, you look at the sin offering, this is just not an easy thing for God to do. But he did do it. He did do it. Something else in the sin offering is it required blood. You're going to read about that a lot in Leviticus, reading of the sin offering. There's blood. But there's something about the blood I want to make clear here. This is in, also in Leviticus chapter 4. I've read these before. I'll read them again, verses 5 through 7. This is concerning the blood of the offering. Then the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of meeting. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood several times before the Lord in front of the veil of sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of meeting, and shall pour the remaining blood of the bull at the base of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. That's something that had to be done with the blood. Now, what's my point? We'll see, the blood had to be shed. It had to be spilled. But something had to be done with that blood. It wasn't just like the, the spilling of blood of itself. The blood needed to be applied in some way to something. And so you see, an ap you see several applications here. You see the blood, you see he has to bring it. He has to take it somewhere. He takes it to the tabernacle. And so you see that he has to dip the blood in the finger. He has to apply it, sprinkle it for the Lord. That's an application. He has to put it on the horns of the altar. That's an application. He has to put it somewhere. And he has to pour it somewhere. Pour it at the base of the altar. Put it somewhere. See, all three of those are applications of blood. And so likewise, the blood of Christ was required for your salvation. It had to be blood. That's the thing you want to see. It had to be blood. Otherwise, it just this isn't going to work. In Acts 20, 28, he says about the church, which was purchased with his own blood. Purchased. See, there's like there's a sense of application. They're like, you know, take it to the tabernacle. Take it. He has to take it. Take it. Didn't say he entered the holy, the holy place with his own blood. He take it. Offer it. That's that's the price. That's that's the that's the the payment due that it gives you salvation. He purchased it. He bought it. And, and and because he did that, because he gave that blood, we are his. Like there's a result of it. And so, but that, that blood had to be required before that could happen. Ephesians. Chapter 2, verse 13 says, You who were once time afar off, away, that's the stranger, that's the alien. You're like, not like I'm just like at a little distance. I mean, I'm, I'm not even welcome. I'm not even in the same place as you. And you have been made nigh, or brought nigh, by the blood of Jesus. There's an application. Is the blood of Jesus actually has done a change in you to where you're actually where God is now. But the, that, that's, again, that's the application of blood. You see that in the Sin offering, there's a several applications here. It's not just one. And, and likewise, the blood of Jesus, it's, it's, ap it's applied in several different ways. It has different effects on you. And also in Revelation 1.5, says you're washed in his own blood. That's, that's definitely application. I mean, it's on you. It's actually removing something from you. Application. 
And so that, that was required. That's a requirement for the sin offering. There has to be blood and something has to be done with that blood. And also, the life of the thing offered was required. I mean, yeah, you couldn't just like cut its arm and take some of its blood. You had to kill it. It had to die. And so, yeah, you, every time you read a, of a sin offering, you say, kill it. It had to be killed before the Lord. That's what it says here. That they lay the hand on the bull's head and they kill the bull before the Lord. And also in chapter 6, it says this, that it's, it was killed where the burnt offering was killed. And so, um, likewise, the life of Christ was also required. It, was, it wasn't like his blood. It had to, it had to actually die because of him putting, having the sins put upon him. This is a Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. It says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's why he was born. It was to die. That's his purpose of coming into the world. It was to die for your sins. But there's things that we see in that fact. The fact that it had to die, that tells us something too. So I'm going to go a little further with that. It shows that the sin just couldn't be ignored. As Sister Maddie like, just talked about it. It couldn't just be ignored. Something had to be done about this. Something had, there had to be some kind of like, like a type of punishment, you could say, because of your sin. Yeah. And so it says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, that concerning what Christ became on our behalf, it says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, as it's written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's like the punishment, the curse. Christ became the curse for you. And so what does that show us? Like Christ becoming a curse for you, what's that show us? That God had to like transfer the sin in order for you to live. That's, that's, that's somewhat portrayed in the, the sin offering because it's something dying, something else dying because of something you did. But even though the blood of bulls and goats, it couldn't take away sin, but that's being pictured here. That's the type. Amen. Is God focusing his wrath off of you and onto this? But there's a reason for Amen. that, though. It's not like just, well, i got to kill something. I'm just going to kill this. That's, that's oh, It's not like that. Jesus actually did have the sins of the world placed on him. That's right. Matthew 8.17, this is speaking of what was prophesied by Isaiah. It said he Took, he himself took our infirmities. He bore our sicknesses. He took them. He bore them. Let's not overlook that. And also in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, who himself, speaking of Jesus, bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. By those stripes you were healed. So, the guilt that you had actually was placed on Jesus. The reasoning for your death sentence was put on Jesus. It wasn't like God just ignored you altogether and you just, here, this is, I'll just do this to him instead. No, I mean, he was, this is why he killed Jesus. This is why he forsook him. That's why he made him a curse because your sin was on him. And he focused his wrath on all of that sin. But it had to be removed. It had to be taken off of you. Otherwise, that's what would have happened to you. You would have been the curse. You would have been killed. You would, you would have been completely forsaken, but Jesus was willing to do that for you. That's what sin, that's something sin in the sin offering. Now, also this thing that I didn't consider before, but there's, there's some stuff said about this. I think it's real important to bring out is that the sin offering, this thing being sacrificed, had to be without blemish. And there's several things here mentioned here. In chapter 4, verse 3, it says that if... Uh, when the priest sins, bring guilt on the people. Then let him offer to the Lord for his sin, which he, which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish as a sin offering. Couldn't have any kind of defect. Also, just a little later in that chapter, verse 23, or if this, his sin which he has committed comes to his knowledge, he shall bring as his offering a kid of the goats, a male without blemish. There it is again. Same chapter, verse 28. Or if his sin which he has committed comes to his knowledge, then he shall bring as an offering a kid of the goats, a female without blemish. So just, this is just one chapter here. Also in verse 32, if he brings a lamb as a sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish. That's continually offered. 
It couldn't have any kind of defect. It had to be the very best. It had to be fit to be offered. It couldn't be blind. It couldn't be sick. It couldn't be lame. It couldn't be dying. It couldn't have a disease. It had to be pure, completely pure. And so what does the Lord think if you offer something that's not worthy to be offered? That's in the book of Malachi, chapter 1, verse 8. He says, and when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Will he be pleased with you? Would you, he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? That's what God says about offering him something that's sick, something that's not worthy to be offered. It's an offense to him. He's angry about it. He said, just see what your own governor does if you try something like that. Offer something defective, something not worthy. Now, if he's not going to accept you, if he's going to be rat wrathful with you over that, what do you think I'm going to be like? Yeah. How do you think I'm going to react when you offer that to me? Right. I demand the best of you, and you come and you offer me this? This is the best you come up with? Defective sacrifices? God demands the best. Amen. And that, be that scene, for sure, in Christ Jesus, the very best, fit for the offering. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, And he made him who knew, he made him, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, knew no sin. That's without blemish. That's pure. That's holy. That's lacking any defect, lacking any imperfection. 1 Peter 1, 18, 19 says, We're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as one offered as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Something you can think about here is uh, when considering the sacrifices, they had to be raised up for this. Like when people had their animals, they had to feed them properly, they had to care for them properly, they had to make ready them for this purpose. It was for an offering. And so they had to make sure it didn't catch disease. They had to make sure it was in its fullest health so that the Lord would accept it when it was sacrificed. Likewise, Christ, when he came into the world, he was, you could see it's like he, was, he came as a baby, but he was being raised up, cultivated, you know, like tested, and, he was tested by the devil. And he, was, uh, he, he proved himself through this growth in his life to be that sacrifice. He proved himself to be worthy to be offered before the Lord as an offering. But that was like, that's like something I didn't think about before. It's like it, the offering, it's like it's raised up. It's not like you just go out randomly and look for a bull, you know. It's like, well, let's see, that one looks good. No, it's something you have, something you've raised up yourself. And God is the one who raised up Jesus. It was something by God's own hand that he got by God's right own, his own right hand, he brought salvation. And so you see the result of that. He's like, I've raised, for, I've raised a sacrifice for myself. I've raised this up. This is my product. And that's the way, the way it is because it came from me. And also, on that note, something does have to be offered. You do have to offer something. I mean, yeah, we say it was without blemish, but that's the thing. Something has to be given. And I'll read this text in Leviticus chapter 5. Concerning this, just in the beginning, it talked about all the things that had to be committed in order for the sin offering to be given. It says that he shall bring, verse 6, he shall a lamb or a kid of the goats as a sin offering. That's what he's going to bring. Now, in, chapter, in verse 7, it says, if he's not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring to the Lord for his trespass, which he has committed to turtle doves or two young pigeons. One is a sin offering and the other is a burnt offering. Then he goes on, he says what's going to happen. And then verse 11 says, If he's not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he who sins shall bring for his offering one-tenth of an F of fine flour as a sin offering. So what's the point there? Something's getting offered here. Well, I don't have a bull. Well, then you're going to offer this. Well, I don't have that. Well, then you're going to offer this. You're going to give something up because you sinned. That's, right. That's the thing you want to see there. And it better be the best you have. You have a lamb in your yard. You better not be giving me flour. That's only if. You don't have the prior things that I mentioned. You don't have two dirtles. You don't have a lamb or a kid of the goats. That's when you can give the flower. You can't get it. But it's going to be the best that you have, whatever you give. And God gave the best. Son of God, that's the best. That goes, that's over everything else. Nothing short of that. Nothing short, nothing short of that's going to work. And also that the sin offering, it was offered before the Lord. You saw that frequently referenced in Leviticus. When they killed it, it was killed before the Lord. It was offered before the Lord. And uh, I just, Leviticus 4, if I could think of like eight passages where you read that, before the Lord. It's like in the full awareness of God. Right. It's something given 
to God. It's not like just some empty ceremonial procedure or tradition that has no effect whatsoever on the people. I mean, it's, this is something God commands. You're doing it unto him. Like offering, it's like I'm just doing this to myself. You know, it's like God's right there. God's watching. I'm like offering, <laughs> offering it to him. In Christ also, he was offered. He was an offering to the Lord, unto God. And what he did was in full awareness of God. Let's see, this is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. It says, walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, to God, for a sweet-smelling aroma. See, that's the thing I mentioned. Before the Lord, that's like right there in that verse, offered to God. It's for God. It's purpose for God. It's in full awareness of his presence. Now, there's some other things I would like to cover here concerning like the effect, the effect of the sin offering, the effect of Christ's offering, like what it's done for us. One thing I can think of is the, the sin offerings, like the sacrifices of animals, this is something that had to be done continually. It wasn't like just one animal sacrifice covered at all. It was like sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. Because you read in the accounts, like if any man sins, then you've got to give a sin offering. That's if you sin, not if you're going to, it's if you did it. So as soon as you did, this had to happen. And this had to be repeated throughout history until the time of Christ. This is just yeah. shot showing us like as long as it's happened, this is just this is the result. This is what's going to happen. It had something that has to be done about it. But Christ offered himself one time, just once, for our sins. Hebrews 9, verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Also in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, one time. So what, what's the thing to see there? I noticed that in the sin offerings it said, like, if any man sins, then you get the sin offering. That's like a past offense. It's not like for something that's going to be committed. This is not so with Christ. The sins that he died for weren't just like the sins of his generation. Or they weren't like just the sins of the saints of old. Or the, the time of the flood. It, it was bigger than that. It was all sin. Amen. Even those that would be committed. The penalty was paid for it all in one. That's why it's one offering. Because it has effect. It removed all sin. If it didn't remove all sin, if it just did, it was the sacrifice given at the time for those people, then would Christ not have to just give himself again and again for sins that would come in the future? The fact, yeah, the fact that there was one should tell us all sin was dealt with as a whole. Yeah. All sin, not some. We could also talk about how the sins remained after the sacrifices of old. They did not remove sins. This is in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bull goats should take away sins. Couldn't do it. So whenever this whole thing is over, after the whole procedure is done with, after the sacrifice has been offered, it's still there. Still on your account, and you're still, you remain unchanged because of it. But then again, that wasn't its design. It wasn't designed to take those sin away, but to show you what had to happen for the sin to be taken away. So like, well, there's all this blood being shed, you know, like why did God wait so long? But he had to show humanity that it was only like what was said before. It had to be Christ's blood. He's showing it that this blood wasn't going to work, but that Christ's blood was the only blood that was going to actually do that work. That's what he was showing in that, that's what he's showing in that sin offering. He's going to show the sins washed away in Christ Jesus, completely removed from you, not charged to your account. And 1 John 3, 5, it says he's manifested to take away our sins. Take them away. Not cover them. Remove them. Get them away from you. Well, how about this aspect? God, is, God not being satisfied fully with the offerings of old. This is in, also in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. Therefore, he came into the world. He said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Speaking of Jesus here. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. There it is. But what, why, what, why wouldn't it? 
it wasn't designed to take away the, the sins of the world. It didn't appease his wrath. It didn't like shift the focus off of you. But rather, it was the type. Yeah. That was the point. It was the type. And so likewise, God's not going to be satisfied in the type, something he never intended to take away, sins. That's not where his satisfaction is going to be. But in the actual removal of the sins, which you could see in Isaiah 53, 10, it said, he pleased the Lord to bruise him. Pleased him. See, that there's a change there. I had no pleasure in sacrifice for sins, but when you read of Jesus, it pleased me. I'm satisfied. What, what made that satisfaction? Because the sin had been put away. The sin had been dealt with. The consequence had been paid. The penalty, his justice has been shown. His righteousness has been shown. And, and, and then most of all, the result, his son is glorified. His son has become the Savior, and you get to live. He doesn't have to destroy you now. He said, what does it say? The Lord, he will all men be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Well, that's possible now that Jesus has died for the sins of the world. He doesn't have to annihilate mankind as he did in the times of the flood. That doesn't have to happen. He's satisfied. It pleased me to bruise him. Oh, good things coming up here. Things that I'm going to work out myself. Look at what I can do now. I'm able to do these things that I foretold for centuries, for millenniums. I can do, I'm going to do that now that this has happened. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Amen. Amen. Pleased him. Also, lastly, how about sins remembered at the sacrifice for sin? That's also, again, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 3, I believe. It says, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. Oh, how discouraging this would be if we met together once a year and we remembered all the things that we've done to displease the Lord. Just imagine all the things you've done. Just having all those things brought to the service constantly, thrown in your face. You're a sinner. You've offended me. You're wicked. You're guilty. You're going to die. Rem a reminder of sins every year. I'm not changed. I'm still the same. I still need help. However, when, when in Christ, it changes from sins, remain, remi sins remembered to sins forgiven. In Colossians 1.14, says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So when we come, when we come before Christ, we remember, we're remembering the removal of sins, not the presence of sins. Amen. I'm remembering forgiveness of sins, not guilt because of sin. I remember it's... Off, it's off the account. It's, God's covered it. It's covered it. It's been removed. It's not charged to my account any longer. It's not imputed to me. God's forgiven it. That's a blessing to be able to see that. But that didn't, these sacrifices all didn't have these effects. But that's the thing I want to just like be really strong about. It wasn't meant to do that. It was a, it was a shadow, a type. It was telling something that was going to happen in the future. And so this was like a hope. For those who you know could grasp it, who could really see Amen. like the purpose of them, this was like a hope for them. It was something that God was going to do. Amen. And we live in a time where this is actually fulfilled. It has actually been fulfilled. There is no more sacrifice for sins. The one, the one penalty has been paid. So I give thanks that I've been able to look through this account and just see the seriousness of sin and that, that the Lord, just how big a work this really was, the sin offering. It wasn't just a small work. And if, the, what, if what we do, if what God tells us to do, that's, that's not a small work. You think what God's doing himself, that's not a small work either. It's a much greater work because God has done it. And so I, th I thank the Lord for the, the effective offering of Christ, that the blood that covered our sins and changed us. And I also give thanks for these things that were written of old so that we might have a better understanding of what has happened when Jesus died.